think I should start by sharing. Sorry, I got caught. Uh, the title of this Bloomberg piece is Gavin Newsom declares California a nation state. So you can imagine that caught my attention. Are we going to succeed from the rest of the US? Oh gosh, hope not. Okay, so um, let's share. And let's get this guy going. All right. Well, I have to do one more thing. I have to move this away. There we go. All right, so the, the title of today's talk is Layout Builder Components Can Break Your Site, Here's How. And um, I am still slated to give this presentation at DrupalCon. We just don't know actually when DrupalCon is going to be. So you guys are getting the first version of it. And I'm absolutely happy if you would give me some feedback. It's a kind of a complicated topic when you get into the details, which are sort of necessary. And so I'm particularly interested in knowing if I went into enough detail. I think I'm not too much detail, and that's actually my concern. I might want to give a little bit more. So very much interested in hearing your feedback on that. And uh, I guess I can't see if we're not doing raising of hands. So so save your questions to the end and off we go. Okay, so who am I? Um, my full name is Andre Angelantoni. I'm the founder of Performant Labs and Performant Labs is a small agency based out of San Francisco. I've been working with Drupal since 5.0, maybe even, I think I remember dipping my toe into 4.7 and um, uh, some of my clients have included France Telecom and CBS Interactive. Dr. Sign Goldman Environmental Prize, Robert Half, and Tesla. So Performant Labs is sponsoring a few Drupal projects. One of them is Layout Builder Kit. Uh, then there's also Campaign Kit, which is a replacement for some of the third-party uh, uh, donation software systems out there, like Classy, Payment Stripe, and we're also the founder of the Drupal Quality Initiative. We're, I'm going to talk a little bit about Layout Builder Kit in this presentation, but none of the other topics uh, we're going to talk about, but you can find those over on Drupal.org. Okay, so what are we going to cover today? Why do we use content management systems? That sets up the whole context for this presentation. Then I'm going to have an instant introduction, not even a brief introduction. There's going to be an instant introduction to Layout Builder because I'm hoping that most people actually have had some exposure to what Layout Builder is. So I'm not going to go into too much depth into that. Uh, we're going to take a look at how configuration is stored in Layout Builder. And then we're going to look at how content is stored. And we're, I'm going to define the fundamental problem. I'm going to give you the solution which is actually not really a solution because you'll see in some ways that, or it's often the case in computers that you have to pick the solution that works for the best set of constraints or circumstances that you're in. You can only say, if this and this are important to you, then you should do this. If this and this are important to you, then you should do this. So that's how I'm going to couch the solution today. Uh, there's a clever workaround that I'm going to share for a problem that I'm going to describe. It's a tease, I'm not telling you what it is yet. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about performance considerations, a brief, brief outline of Layout Builder Kit and how it applies to this topic, and uh, a brief overview of the emerging Layout Builder ecosystem because I'm one of the people who's maintaining the page over on drupal.org keeping track of the various modules in Layout Builder. And this is really important. So I try to spread the word as much as possible that there is a lot you can do with Layout Builder now. Uh, then we're going to go through some resources and then finally some Q&A. OK, a note on nomenclature. When discussing Layout Builder, a component is the same thing as a block. That's what happened in Drupal 8. Blocks became com uh, component, or sorry, the blocks are actually plugins in Drupal 8, and you'll see the wording either components or blocks. If you see either one of them, they're the same thing. <coughs> when, I, when I say the word page, it's the same thing as a node in this case. 
All right, so here's my instant introduction to Layout Builder. In Layout Builder is a souped up panelizer if you've worked with that module. Now, not everyone has worked with panelizer. So another way to say it is if you haven't worked with panelizer, it's a way to control the presentation of several parts of Drupal, including nodes, taxonomy terms, and menus. So a lot of people don't understand that Layout Builder will work with not just pages, but actually taxonomy terms and with the addition of an additional module, even menus. That's a benefit of the way Drupal 8 is architected that we get this sort of expansiveness <coughs> of features. And you can create rigid layouts. <coughs> <and constant pages. coughs> Oops, someone's, someone's on unmute. You can create rigid layouts that content editors can't change, and sometimes you want that, or you can create layouts that are completely editable by content editors or somewhere in between. And that was part of the design of Layout Builder right from the get-go, to be able to either be completely rigid or completely flexible. All right, so what kind of site do you want? I would argue that we all want. Do you want the fast, sexy site that works, high performance? Or do you want something that's kind of breaking down? Obviously, you want the sexy red Italian motorcycle. So we're going to, I'm going to explain how to help make sure that that happens. So why do we use content management systems? to make managing the content on our website easier for the teams that work on them. All right. How do content management systems do that? Well, they have a laundry list of features from managing media assets to spell checking, but two features are particularly important for many teams. Uh, that's the wrong title. I have to go change that. One of them is page versioning. Each change to the page saves a new version. You want, content editors want to be able to roll back changes quickly. And in some cases, some environments, they, there's another group that wants to see the value of a page and that's the legal department. Sometimes you wanna be able to go back in time and say, what was the value, what, was, what were we displaying on this page on this date? If you get, if the company gets sued or something like that, that's often a question that you might get. Okay, the second one is workflow. Content editors want to collaborate and ensure high quality on the work that they're putting online. So a typical workflow is to change the status from draft to needs review to published. Okay, and you, these are often really critical. There are a fair number of sites that don't need workflow, that's true, but there are a lot that do. And there are a lot that need revisions. And you need to have revisioning work for either of these two features to work. So let's talk about revisioning first. But before we do that, we have to talk about the two different ways that web, web content management systems can make their pages. The first is the static approach. So some CMSs create a full HTML page and write it to the file system. Adobe Experience Manager does that. And each page is stamped with a date. So to see back in time, just pull up an older version of the page because the content was all written into the file. All the HTML that was actually displayed to the user at a moment in time is written into the file. And when a change is made, the old version is archived or somehow renamed, and then the new version comes into place. So if you want to make that old page current, just rename it. So if it was, if the old one was front page and then that date, you could just rename it to frontpage.html and then all of a sudden your front page is back online. That's how these sorts of systems work with revisioning because they're all writing the content of the pages into a file. The other way is the dynamic approach, and that's the way that Drupal does it. So the page is rendered on the fly, and sometimes for each user when the user is logged in, and that's where the personalization comes in. There's even a bit of personalization, of course, that happens when you're anonymous because you've got all these third-party services that you're integrating with. But generally, 
you are showing mostly the same page to most of the people. Now, it's true that we do add several layers of caching. And caching, by definition, stores a version of the page. But these page revisions or versions are not retained long term, and they cannot be used for versioning. All right, so what's the problem? We may break these two features, versioning and workflow, depending on where component content is stored. And I'm going to get into that. So let's look at how components are made. Well, what are components? First, let's get a, an understanding of that. That's the visual representation of a component. And you could say the components in Drupal are divided into three parts. Part one is the rendered HTML. And that's the button or the carousel or the dialog box that you see in the right, on the right hand side. And these are often rendered by Twig templates, that's the most common, or some sort of front end framework like React or Vue or one of those other systems. Part two is the configuration form. This is the form that's used to edit your component. And now what you're actually looking at is a configuration form for Layout Builder for actually one of the components in Layout Builder Kit, which is the tab component. And it has that little, it's, it's, it's being displayed on a little pane on the right hand side. And when I make all my changes and I click Add Block, wherever I had told Layout Builder to insert that block, that's where it will go. So I have an, a user interface for the configuration form as part two. And then part three is you need the source content. And that's going to be the text, the images, or whatnot. OK, so we're going to get a little bit deep, more detailed. So where is the component configuration saved? And this is necessary to understand because it's going to explain to you why things can break. So we have to get into this level of detail. You're seeing right now a little snapshot of um, a, a piece of Layout Builder. It's got a simple component, just the, the Drush logo. And where is that configuration for that component actually stored? And we're interested in more than just the presentation of the component, such as whether it has a border around it, because you can start to do that stuff. There are now ways that you can set styles so that components have rounded borders or square borders or different colored backgrounds. All that stuff is starting to emerge. But we're also interested in the content of the block. OK, so the first location is that the configuration could be stored is with the entity definition. And it can be with the content type definition, or the taxonomy definition, or the menu definition. Remember how I said Layout Builder can actually work with all three of those. And the, the, the interface is actually the same. You'll see the tabs that you're seeing right there, manage field, manage form display, and manage display, even when you're editing a taxonomy. When you store configuration in the layout that is attached to a, a definition, it applies to all of the entities, which could be all of the nodes of that content type, or all of the taxonomy terms, or all of the menu items. And that gets turned on when you go to the Manage Display tab and you click that box, that first one, Use Layout Builder. So you see that it's already checked, and you click on Save, the page redraws, and the former user interface is replaced with Manage Layout. So when you click layout, Manage Layout here, you're going to make changes to a layout that apply to all of the nodes in this case. In this case, it's all of the nodes of content type landing page, which you can see. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer that I can point. Why don't I have a pointer that I can point to? Hmm. It's uh, for a landing page. OK, so when you are editing and you're editing 
a layout for a content type, you will be told through that little green display message, you are editing the layout template, in this case, for all the book page content items. Every change that you make on this layout shows up on all of the book pages, at least when you first make them. If you then change them later, then you can deviate, but they're all gonna start the same way. Now, the second location where you can store configuration is actually with the individual node, the individual block or menu. That should have said taxonomy. The individual node, the individual taxonomy or the menu. And you turn that on by clicking the bottom checkbox. So now you can actually change the template on the for the, all of the nodes, or you can, with that other checkbox turned on, start to make custom changes for each node. And you'll often hear the wording called template overrides when you have that bottom checkbox turned on. When you turn on that bottom checkbox, if you go back to the Manage Fields tab, you'll see a new field has been added for you by Drupal. And that's where the layout is going to be stored inside of that field for that individual node. And here are the tables that also get added to the database. The second that you click that checkbox for whatever you're working with, um, oh, maybe I can say blocks here. I actually have to add, so it should be nodes, blocks, taxonomies, and menus then. That's what I should be really saying there. So when you add a, a when you check that checkbox, you get these new tables that are created, and that's where the layout is going to be stored. And each one gets its own table. So how is the configuration stored? Well, it's stored as a serialized string. Looks something like that. So in there, if you say you want a um, solid border or rounded corners or something like that, that's where it all gets defined. Now, obviously you need some sort of component that knows how to read this definition and take action on it. So, Layout Builder won't work on its own without components that know how to draw themselves. Okay, so now where's the content saved? We talked about where the configuration save is saved, but where's the content saved? Well, the content can be saved inside of the uh, fields that you define for your component. So. If you make a block component and you add a whole bunch of fields and then you go look inside of the database, you will see each of those fields has a new table that shows up in the database. As you add more fields, more tables get added. And you can also see that if revisioning is turned on, the tables come in pairs. You get the basic table like block content body, but then you also get the revision, block content revision body. Okay, so you can also store the, con the content, for instance, if you're using components from Layout Builder Kit, inside of the serialized string that you saw in the previous slide. So not only will that serialized string hold the configuration, like do I want a solid border or not, but you can also put the content there. So there are a couple kinds of standard Drupal components. You've got global components, which are also known as reusable components, and you've got custom inline components, which are non-reusable components. And depending on what you need, you're gonna use one or the other. But here's the thing, both of these types of components use tables to store their content. And they use that using the field API, one table per field. Now this is important, and you'll see why in a second. So what was the problem again? 
The problem is if I'm trying to pull up a version of the page from the past, what version of the blocks or components is going to be pulled up? For Drupal to know that, the revision of the block needs to be stored with the layout. And as of Drupal 8.9, 9.0, reusable components do not store their revision ID with the layout. So if you blindly make a whole bunch of blocks using the reusable components and then place them on a page, and then you want to be able to go back in time to see what the value of the page is, Drupal has no way of knowing that because the revision IDs are not stored there. As far as I can tell, there's no technical reason why that won't eventually happen. My sense is that it just didn't get sorted out in time. And so at some point, perhaps there will be a revision to the whole framework that will allow that to happen. Okay, sim simple custom components, not simply, simple custom components in your own modules can be made so that their revision is stored in the layout. So if you have a group of programmers that want to make your own components, just because Drupal didn't do it doesn't mean that you can't do it. So if you don't do that, if you are, sorry, if you're not careful with how you make your components, you will be the person that tells the client that page revisioning, workflow, and even workspaces are all broken. You don't want to do that. So what do you have to do? You have to watch out for the complexity. You have to watch out for parent-child relationships and components, like a field that points to another object. These two are not stored in the layout and pulling up an old page will show the most re recent version of the child and workflow will break. So what's the solution? Very careful design. You have to be very aware, your developers have to be very aware, you or your developers have to be very aware of how component content is stored with all the different kinds of components there are, because there are quite a few, and whether older revisions of workflow needs to be available. You need to understand the details of each component type and test everything thoroughly. If you just blindly make components, you will break these features. You could make a rule of thumb where you say, don't use tables to store content. There's a drawback to that, which I'll show you in a second, but you could say don't use tables, just store all the content with the configuration on the node. You could do that as part of the serialized string. And that's a completely valid approach. It's the approach that we took with Layout Builder Kit. And I'm gonna show you some other frameworks, some other layout builder systems, and they all chose exactly the same mechanism. So in, a, in an interesting way, all the frameworks out there that I've been able to examine so far have all chosen the same method of storing the content in the serialized string. Yet the default mechanism that Drupal is using is to actually store them in, in tables. And that we know breaks. Definitely be very careful or don't use parent-child content relationships at all, okay? you can, if you're using tables. In other words, if you need a parent-child content relationship, like for instance, a tab that has multiple tabs, tab one, tab two, tab three, all of those are the children, but the tab component itself is the parent, you can store that parent-child relationship in the serialized string. But the second you start putting that into tables, you're gonna break those other features. All right, so now there is a clever workaround for getting parent-child relationships with tables. It's not super extensive, but I'm, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I just wanna mention it in case anyone comes to this situation where they say, I actually really do need a parent-child relationship and I really do need to store this in the table. And what you can do instead of actually connecting two tables together is you can make one table act like a parent-child relationship by having the rows and having multiple rows for a component and using the field delta to specify the child. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Developers who get into the bowels of the system are gonna know what I'm talking about there. So why though do you maybe wanna use storage in the tables? 
Well, because then you get to leverage the rest of the framework. The rest of the framework knows how to work with tables. So you know, the question is why not just store everything in a serialized string and call it a day? So the diff module, for instance, is used to compare what changes between two versions of the page. Modules like the diff module won't work with serialized strings. They don't know how to dip inside of Layout Builder's proprietary mechanism, pull out the value from one revision of the page, do the same thing with an older revision of the page, and then compare the two object graphs. That's not something that they know how to do. But they do know how to compare two versions of a page where the fields have changed. So that's one reason why you may not want to store everything in a serialized string. You may look and you may say, actually, there are a bunch of modules that I think I want to use. I'm willing to give up workflow. I'm willing to give up page versioning and workspaces in exchange for that. Um, personally, I wouldn't go down that path too often. You'd have to be very, very sure with the site owner that they're never, ever going to want to do any kind of workflow in the future. Um, I suspect that in the, in the real world, that's going to be a rarely chosen choice. All right, then there's one more thing to worry about if you're storing your content in tables, and that's performance. By default, Drupal makes one table per field. So if I have a component that has five fields in it, name, address, who knows, maybe a picture of the person or something, then I'm going to have five fields. To collect all the content for a single component requires a SQL join statement between multiple tables. It's got to go collect all the data from those five from those five fields. Hang on, the chat here. Um, or a component with 36 fields, someone says, yes. <laughs> okay, yes, if there's a component with 36 fields, your rent page rendering is going to grind to a halt. And you are, it's going to be very painful. It's gonna be very painful for your editors. You're going to, you're going to just hate yourself, okay? So, especially if you have multiple components that have multiple fields, then it gets really, really, really bad. So, in, at Tesla, we did a test where we put, let me see if I can get the numbers right. It was about, it was about 20 components on a page, and each of the components had something like five fields. And 20 components, if you go take a look at a Tesla page, is a typical page for, for Tesla. So it's not even an abnormal one. And it took something like 14 seconds for it to collect all the information and to render that page for the first time. Now, you put that online, and it's just not, it's unacceptable. Now, it's true that you're going to cache that, but it's still unacceptable because the, when you turned on your site after an upgrade or something like that, and you have an onslaught of, of um, traffic and every page is taking 14 seconds, your hard drive is going to thrash and the performance is going to be really, really terrible. Then you end up going down and you have to warm caches and things like that. It starts to just get to be a pain in the butt. But in any case, it's still a pain for the editor. So you don't want to do that. So there is a workaround if you're making if you're making all your components and custom modules, you can store all the content for the component in a single table using the entity API, not the field API. So instead of storing one field per table, which is what the field API does, you can custom make your own table that has all the fields you want. And therefore, if you have 20 components on a page, it's not doing 20 components that each have a five-way SQL join. It's just doing 20 read statements, much faster. And then 20 insert statements when you make a new revision. Okay, so that's the problem that you have to be careful for. Okay, hope if you want, hopefully this will be available. You can come back and review this or the, the, the DrupalCon one will probably have a few more details. 
Um, but the key is have your, either if you're a developer or have your developers really get to understand what the trade-offs are so that you don't paint yourself into a corner. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Layout Builder Kit. And what we did is we used serialized string storage. And the components so far are book navigation, icon text, an image on the left, text on the right, or vice versa, an image, a render component, which just says I have a, the idea of a node and I need you to render the whole node in the, in the page, uh, rich text, tab component, and a video component. So we have seven components so far. And you can get a full walkthrough of the kit from the webcam presentation I gave a few weeks back. And that will tell you how that will give you a little bit more detail of how that works. But that presentation doesn't talk as in depth as this one does regarding the problems with component design if you're not careful and why we chose this way. So they're kind of sister presentations. Now for Layout Builder Kit, we've got seven, but you can go infinite. I mean, there's a divider, there's a, an accordion, a quote com component, buttons, all these other components can still be made. So please, if, if you are, find yourself working on a component and you think that it would be useful for the kit, uh, add an issue queue, let's talk about it. I'll give you some guidance. You can either, just, or you can just take the code, duplicate what we've already done. You'll notice that everything is in serialized strings. So naturally we're not gonna accept components that use tables because we want, all, at least for this version, we want everything to be consistent. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the Emerging Layout Builder ecosystem only briefly. Uh, layout Builder assets, way to store assets in, or sorry, to identify assets on existing components in Layout Builder. Asymmetric translation, important for you to know, Layout Builder does not know how to do translation, so you need either this component or the symmetric translation, which is coming up. You need to install one or the other if you're gonna do multi-language with Layout Builder. Uh, layout Builder browser, a layout library, modal, that one takes the little pane, the configuration form on the, on the right-hand side and moves it into the center of the page inside of a nice big dialog box, uh, making it much easier for content editors. Layout Builder restrictions, the Layout Builder by definition gives you access to all of the components in the system that are available at that time, but often you don't wanna give your content people all of them because they're just confusing. So Layout Builder restrictions will uh, allow you to whittle that down. So often you whittle it down to just, could even be just 12 different kinds of components. Block, blast, block Blacklist does the same thing, but it's not just in Layout Builder, it's also in Blocks. Layout Builder Styles, this is quickly becoming the first Layout Builder module I install on any project because it gives me styles right away that I can apply either to sections or to components. Dynamic Layouts, um, I'm not gonna get into that. The title basically tells you what it does. Entity Browser Block, allowing you to browse any kind of block. Mini Layouts, this is like mini panels in the, in the panel system in Drupal 7. So it's the ability to put components within components. And then Layout Builder Everywhere, this one is fascinating. It's like panels everywhere. It will allow you to put components both in the header region or rather any region other than content. Layout Builder right now only knows how to work with the content region. And you still have to make your headers or footers or sidebars using other methods like the region mechanism in the template system. But with Layout Builder Everywhere, you can actually start to use components on every region. Okay, and that's the sister module to Layout Builder Asymmetric Translation. Uh, depending on what you need, you'll use one or the other. Okay, so take note, this is important. So there's still development being done on Layout Builder. It's not yet possible to export and import layouts. So if you wanna move content between sites, we now have tools that allow you to move nodes and menus and all kinds of stuff, uh, but you can't move layouts yet, okay? So work is underway though. It's actually pretty close. So keep an eye on that one if you are interested in being able to export and import layouts.
Layout Builder Everywhere will extend Layout Builder to regions. I've already mentioned that one. And this one here is there's a patch to bring Layout Builder into Page Manager. So for people who remember Panels, Panels had its own little component layout mechanism in Drupal 7. I'm not actually sure if that got brought across to Drupal 8. I don't think it did. But that's OK, because what's happening is that issue is building, is, is allowing Layout Builder to create variants inside of the page manager. OK, so here's some resources. Um, I gave a bad camp presentation on the modules, the Emerging Layout Builder system. So if you want more detail on that, you can see that. Uh, that is the page that stores all the modules that I and a few other people know about that exist for the Layout Builder ecosystem. So go check those out. Highly, highly recommend before you start a project, make sure that you look at that and you understand what each one of those modules that do. I suspect that some of them are going to move into core at some point. They're that valuable. OK, additional systems to, in, to investigate. There's Glazed Builder made by Super Themes. And they've got a fully functional layout system. It's actually further ahead than Layout Builder because they've got way more components. Now we can catch up because we can, hopefully with a whole bunch of people, we can start to contribute to projects like Layout Builder Kit. There's Acquia Cohesion. Cohesion was actually an independent company. Acquia purchased them maybe about eight months ago, I want to say. So now I don't think you actually have access to Cohesion unless you're also an Acquia client. And when I looked at both, definitely when I looked at Cohesion, it used exactly the same mechanism as we're using in Layout Builder Kit. It's storing the content in the configuration so that you, you retain everything I said. You retain the versioning, the workflow, and so on. OK. Um, Elementor, I think that comes from WordPress. It seems to be very popular, but it's actually been ported into Drupal. Now, why would you want to use that? Well, I don't know exactly how good it is. I haven't played with it. Um, it. People speak very highly of it. The benefit of us having a layout builder plus layout builder kit and all of the other ecosystem modules is the tighter integration with Drupal. So anytime you bring something from WordPress like Elementor or Gutenberg, that's another WordPress project, you get their benefits, but it's not going to be as tightly integrated. All right. So that is it. Whew. All right. Can we, how do we do this, Amy June? Do people raise their hand? I can start by just answering questions in the chat. Um, okay, so good. does serialized saved content break content migration, make it harder since it won't be on a standard table? Um, yeah, that's the thing. So. I haven't tested migration, but somebody should look into that. If the migration mechanism depends on the REST and or, and or JSON API, then it won't work because it does require those interfaces to be exposed. And um, until that's fixed, which is actually not too far off, that may not work. Now, migration may not use those. APIs, the REST and the JSON. It might use the file system, in which case it probably just needs a plugin. So if I were in the position of wondering how to migrate something, I would definitely check for a plugin for migration and then go see if it has REST or JSON API uh, requirements, and that will tell you if it will work. Okay, and then Mayor Mariano says um, LBUX is one for the community to ra rally around as well. Yeah, I haven't taken a look at that yet is this the second time yeah it was i think it was it spawned from a ticket people complaining about layout builders ux so tim plunkett decided to create a module to just kind of have the community work on that and then that eventually will make it back into layout builder itself so it's it's usability improvements yeah totally uh, makes the buttons look better uh, i install it right away on new builds just because it immediately feels better Oh, great. Okay, cool. I will put that in the next version of this um, presentation. Thank you for that. Anything else? Anyone else have any questions? In regards to the entity storage, 
do you not see that being the path forward here for Layout Builder, or do you feel like it's going to move towards a serialized approach just because of the, the, the versioning requirements and translation, I guess? Oh my God, I've gone through this, you know, this, we spent months on this. And it's, it's hard to know what the right thing is right now. I think that it's going to be serialization. And I think that is because it's less work to make serialization work and continue to work. Whereas if you start to make components that use the underlying file system, you're going to have to be worried about all the things I just talked about. And it's not necessarily going to be as performant. Now, it can get pretty close because like I said, once you, once you change all your components from using fields to just one big table, even if you have 20, even if you have 20 components on the page, it's still only 12, 20 reads, okay? Which is way better than 20 reads, very simple reads rather than 20 reads that have a join statement. But that's actually not even as fast as just reading the serialized strings because the serialized strings are, are just sitting in the, in the component layout. And uh, the way it works is each section gets its own record. So you would have, if you have six sections on the page, you have six reads that you require, and any one of those sections can have as many components as you want. So there's a little bit of math you'd have to do there, but generally the most performant is going to be the one that the serialized string method. Yeah, it almost speaks to the need here. We might need a module that shows us how performant or how many reads we're calling on a single layout page and maybe set some kind of threshold to say, hey, you know, you're creating an unperformant page because you've got components with many, many yeah, fields. I, yeah, and you know, if that had been built in from the, you know, that would have been amazing if that had been built right. in from the show. But, I can guarantee you a lot of sites are being built right now that are, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to say a month before they're supposed to turn it on. This thing is too slow. Right. It'll be field collections all over again. Yeah. And they are going to realize it's because they didn't pay attention to what I'm talking about here. Right. It's going to, it's, it's going to get ugly. It's one of those situations where Drupal's going to get the blame for it when it's not Drupal's fault. Um, it's just, we don't know. We're still young about knowing this tool and we're going to implement it wrong a couple times. It's the community's fault. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This is informative. Um, as somebody who's been using Layout Builder for since its inception, um, and actually building a SaaS product with it, um, uh, there's, you know, definitely some things here. I didn't, I didn't even realize that your Layout Builder kit was available. Uh, we should have known about that a little bit sooner, but thank you. Oh, I'm doing my best to get the word out there. And actually, um, Dries mentioned that in his last keynote. He said, one of the things that we might want to do is create a component library. I don't know if you guys all caught that in his keynote. It was, I was listening for it, so I caught it. Yeah, well, how, I mean, how best would we do that? Would we just create a module that we would just contribute to and that would be, I mean, layout builder kit maybe being it, but, um, or are we looking at, you know, groups of things? Actually, Rajab, I'd like to hear from you <laughs> what you're working on related to, uh, to layout builder and components that you're working on. Well, uh, just to answer your first question, it's just download the code, take a or you don't even have to download nowadays because we can yep. do it on just take a look at how the components are put together. It's really fast to make a new component if it's a simple component. Just duplicate it, change the names, and um, just make sure it renders properly. We're handling the ones that we think are the most common use cases because we're actually coming across these issues inside of client builds. And so we're eating our own dog food and, and iterating those components as we go. So actually in the last two days, we just taught the video component, how to read fields on a taxonomy. At the beginning, it just knew how to do it for nodes. Now it knows how to do it for taxonomies. And then we'll teach it how to do it in other cases as needed. But it's actually pretty fast to make 
a component. And there's no reason why we can't build that library up super, super quick. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be layout builder kit, not attached to it. But wherever we do it, we, we should as a community in a year, we should have all those components ported from all those other systems. There's no reason why we shouldn't. Accordions and carousels and all that sort of stuff. Yes, uh, Andrew, I'm with you and thank you for Amy for inviting me to this meetups. Even I'm far from you guys. Oh, you're welcome. Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm from Jordan, actually, in Jordan now. And uh, it's it's quite like uh, five in the morning, around like that. Just uh, thanks a lot, really, for inviting me. I've been watching you guys, and I've been watching all the works with uh, layout builder kits as well. And it's really exciting to see something like that, because I've been working on building a tool, same around like, around the layout builder kit but it's the time for the components as you said we have it's all to build these components the tabs and accordions some components are really complex and they may be they may need some relations but uh, if we could save them inside the uh, the uh, synchronized and that's that will be nice inside the inline blocks or the entity blocks yeah it's this is the point like i've been trying to force all my team in my company telling them no don't use very graph don't don't try to use any of this referencing uh, like very graph for me it does feel like the field reference or uh, uh, do you remember in drupal 7 yeah yeah, yeah it's like well, the field referencing it's a parent child relationship for sure yes yeah so is it right? Is it right if I'm trying to force all these guys not to use any entities, uh, if it's revisioned or not revisioned? For me, uh, personally, my opinion, not to use any. As well, uh, okay. as you said, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think the easiest thing to say is put everything in a serialized string, unless you guys have the time in the in your calendar. Start having at least one person really understand the ins and outs so that you make the right choices. Because if you don't have someone that, that can spend the time and then teach all the other people, then it's you, there's a high probability you're gonna make a mistake and you're gonna break those features. So the safest thing to do is to keep everything in a serialized string. And the serialized string, you can, you can have as complex an object tree inside of that serialized string as you want. And then all of a sudden, all you do is you just load the serialized string, it's in an object, you can you can add a whole bunch of methods. You can put trees in there. You can you can do whatever you want because at that point you're just storing the export of an object into the component configuration. Now yes. with the Tesla project, we were doing enough of that that we actually had to expand the the field length of the layout builder field. Um, I think it was okay. 16 by default or something like that, and it wasn't big enough. So we, we had to go add an alter to the field to make it much bigger and then, you know, it becomes 2 billion bytes or whatever it is. Okay. So it, it, you, you, you might bump into that, but that's simple to fix. Good that, good that. Th thanks a lot and th uh, thanks very much really for uh, Amy for inviting me as well. Oh, you're welcome. Glad you could make it. Cheers, guys. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you for getting, I don't know if you stayed up or if you got out of bed early, but thank you for coming. I think that's so rad. This is one of our biggest SF Dugs we've had in a long time. So thanks for everybody for coming together. Thank you. All right, then let's, if there are no more questions, I, you can just email me, uh, aangel at performantlabs.com. So that's A-A-N-G-E-L at performantlabs.com. Send me a question or find me on Slack. I'm on all the Slack channels and um, I'll do my best to answer or point you to the right resource. So thanks for organizing, Ann and Amy June. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank Stay you. safe, everyone. Bye. Hey. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Woo Thank and you. For April. Yeah.